a very good morning and a warm warm welcome to this online orientation session today's talk is a motivational talk by shri dushyant sridhar on the topic knowledge is power shri dushyant sridhar is one of the most sought after public speakers in sanatana dharma who renders discourses in english and tamil he has rendered over 3000 discourses in 125 cities across 23 countries he enjoys a wide spectrum of audience following him on youtube with over 70000 subscribers and 15 million views he manages a website www.desikadaya.org with over 1200 hours of free content and a vedic e learning portal abhinava e patashala that provides courses to learners sans any discrimination uh he has acted in the movie vedanta desika as the protagonist decides penning his story and dialogues he has authored a coffee table book on vedanta desika that has been both critically acclaimed and best selling in its genre he organizes heritage tours and conceptualizes dance productions he manages desika daya a charitable trust that has donated and sponsored cultural activities for over 4 million indian rupees he is a recipient of coveted titles like sarva kala chudamani and hari katha bharati he was declared a global 30 under 30 by bitsa he is an alumnus of bits pilani and currently lives with his family in bengaluru With this brief introduction, I now invite Sri Dushyant to deliver his motivational talk on knowledge is power. Vijnana Vishrana na Baddha Diksham Dayani Dhim Deha Bhutam Sharanam Devam Hayagrivam Aham Prapadye. Namaskaram. I am very delighted to be addressing a whole lot of over 2000 students who have joined the very revered acclaimed and respected shastra for me shastra is my other home i have had a plethora of opportunities to be addressing both its student community as well as the faculty this is a wonderful opportunity virtually to be speaking to you all i thought of taking two statements from the indic the vedic civilization that we have all bequeathed one is gnanam paramam balam which is knowledge is the ultimate or the superior or the most supreme power second is vidya dadati vinayam knowledge is that which bestows humility on a person at the outset both these statements one which is knowledge is supreme power and the other one being knowledge which bestows humility may seem a bit uh, conflicting uh, to some we may, may we may end up even calling it an oxymoron because power is such a powerful word so if you have to think of power you'll think of a human being with an immense strength with a lot of money power with lot of qualifications that go behind his name so this is what comes to our mind when we speak of power on the other hand let's take the word uh, humility or modesty that's something that makes a human being so simple humble and we say knowledge gives power knowledge gives humility so 
one source which is knowledge giving two different streams and can these streams exist together are they mutually exclusive or, or are they one and the same for which we need to understand our rich civilization we need to go back to our civilization of course while uh, i speak of our civilization i am very very respectful and equally mindful of the other worldly civilizations ours was not the only civilization so when i speak of our civilization it is the indus valley civilization later uh, 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 equated and called by many historians as the vedic civilization so that's not the only civilization if you look back in history and you talk to historians and research scholars and archaeologists they'll say that there were very very thriving respected civilizations in the world so let's speak of the Egyptian civilization. We can talk of the Sumerian civilization. We can even uh, think of uh, the Mesopotamian civilization. There is a Persian civilization. There is a Chinese civilization, the Huanghu civilization. So all these were also equally respected civilizations. They too had their own set of beliefs. They too had their own their cuisine, their textiles, the way they spoke, the way they acted, their architecture. All together they had... A very very rich civilization but since we are speaking of the larger Indian subcontinent that may extend from the larger parts of Afghanistan to the complete Pakistan to the entire India that we speak of today Nepal to some extent Bhutan the lower part of Tibet Bangladesh Thailand Laos Cambodia Vietnam Indonesia, the entire archipelago nation and Malaysia and Sri Lanka all put together is a larger Indian subcontinent though they may exist as different nations or countries today which I am completely mindful and very respectful of when we speak of history we are talking about the civilization that had its influence in these geographies so what is the knowledge that we derive from this civilization and where do we land in bringing about uh, a, a resolution to the conflicting statements which is knowledge is power and knowledge is humility traditionally okay let's assume we can even imagine the times when we didn't have a whatsapp maybe 10 years back i don't remember having used whatsapp 20 years back i'm sure i didn't know much of google and 30 years back i'm not sure even if there were 10 people in my city who had computer and 40 years back i'm not even going that far i'm not that old as well so as we go back in history, imagine the days when we didn't have electricity, imagine the days when we didn't have trains, imagine the days when we didn't have flight. People still lived, they breathed, they ate, they reproduced, they all had families. So let's go back in history and check how knowledge was dispensed. For which there is a very interesting statement. This is from Bhagavad Gita, where Arjuna asks a volley of questions to him it was very simple because he was the one who was questioning asking questions is just so simple one and to him the person whom he was aiming those questions at was none but his very cousin because Krishna and Arjuna were related Krishna's father Vasudeva and Arjun's father who was Kunti they were siblings so they were cousins so he could shoot a volley of questions to lord krishna and krishna took the pain in replying to each of those questions in such immaculate detail but remember this questioning was not done in some household it was done on the war field imagine our soldiers are standing at the border either in ladakh or in pok wherever they are and there somebody asks such volley of questions and the other brigadier gives him the answers called Bhagavad Gita. Wouldn't it be astonishing, amazing? So the questions were asked on the field of Kurukshetra. That itself amazes us. So Arjuna had questions. Remember, Vedic civilization had this unique concept that you could question anybody on anything. But do it respectfully. You could question anybody. When I say anybody, you could even question God. You can question God on a variety of issues and you can question God himself or herself. So that open and liberal beware. 
that, that I'm sure most civilizations of the past and even of the current do not entertain. But we as a Vedic civilization, we were a party to questions and answers. If Arjuna had not asked questions and Krishna had not given replies, we wouldn't be having the so-called text called Bhagavad Gita. If Maitreya, an 80-year-old man, didn't ask his 20-year-old teacher called Parashara Maharishi questions, we wouldn't have the compilation called Vishnu Puranam. If Janamejaya, the king, hadn't questioned and the Rishi called Vaishampayana hadn't given answers, we wouldn't be having the book called Mahabharata. If Valmiki hadn't questioned and Narada hadn't replied, we wouldn't have this beautiful work called Ramayana. Now that you're all going to read in this land of the Tamils called Tamil Nadu, and especially in Tanjavur, which is the land of the very, very celebrated kings who have had a history of over a thousand years called the Cholas, this land has its beautiful, very, very old language called Tamil. And in Tamil, we have a Vedam called Thiruvai Muri. Those of you who may not be accustomed to the South Indian languages may find these names a bit intriguing and very tough. That's okay, just listen to this. It's called Thiruvai Muri. And you know how this beautiful poem of over thousand verses was born? Because one person asked the question, To which his guru replied, It was a question on the very existence of the Jivatma and Paramatma. And here was upon a beautiful work. So let us consider the scriptures like Ramayana, Mahabharata, Bhagavata, Vishnu Purana. Yaksha Prashna, Sanat Sujatiya, Viduraniti, Vishnu Sahasranam, Bhagavad Gita or the work called Thiruvayamari in Tamil, whichever language this civilization has had the habit of entertaining questions. You could question God. So while Arjuna shot a volley of questions at Krishna, Krishna patiently replied on the war field. But he had one thing to say. Arjuna, you have a volley of questions. I am duty bound to answer, but remember, you should not be using this technique to every other person you see in this world. I am your cousin. We have grown up together. We are chaddi buddies. So I will take up your questions and however you are, I will answer. What is it, however you are? Because on the war field, Arjuna was commanding. So if Arjuna has questions, he is a student. If Krishna is replying, he is a teacher. But look at the pedestal. Arjuna is seated above, Krishna is seated below. And some of the commentators and uh, people who are uh, adept at literature go up to the extent of saying, Arjuna was seated with his footwear that was rubbing on the shoulders of Krishna. So the student is trying to be disrespectful towards his teacher. But Krishna said, see, you have asked me questions. Let me not make it an emotional issue. I am duty bound to answer those questions. But remember, Arjuna, if you have similar such questions and you want to ask people in this world those questions, go and ask. You feel, feel free to ask. But do it only and after you serve them. I want answers to my questions. I need the answers to questions from this particular person. I will go and do whatever little I can. Yatha Shakti. If this is my caliber, I will do whatever little I can. I will offer him services. I will offer her services. Looking at my sincerity and devotion, that person will be pleased with me. And at the end he will say or she will say, thanks for your services. I wish to give you something in return. Would you want something? When that person asks, then Put forth your questions in a very, very respectful manner. Tadvidhiv pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya. Arjuna asks, why should I do that? I will just go ask questions. It doesn't matter. I will throw a volley of questions. How does it matter if I serve that person first? If that person has answers, let that person give answers to me. Why should I serve? Krishna said, have patience Arjuna. Having completed my shloka. Tadvidhiv pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya. Question after you have offered your services. Arjuna asked why, to which Krishna said, Upadekshyanti te jnanam. Only then 
the answer which comes as knowledge to you from that person will last in you. Remember, whichever course you're joining, you could be of the engineering group, you could be of the law group, whichever group. You, have, you may have your friends who are joining medicine. Wherever we go, acquiring knowledge is step one. Retaining that knowledge is step two. Most of us may end up doing step one, but step two is where the problem comes. So how do I understand step two? So that step two is retaining that knowledge. How do I retain that knowledge? That is only when I have immense respect to the person who is dispensing it. So Krishna said, do ask your questions, but do it after the services. After your services are offered, when you ask questions and when you receive that knowledge with utmost respect and devotion, that knowledge will stay in you. Tadvidhi pranipatena pariprashnena sevaya upadekshanti degnanam jnaninaha tatvadarshinaha. So knowledge is power because it is knowledge that makes a person work in a certain area. Correct? That way it is power. Because that knowledge is able to offer that person a job. That knowledge is able to offer the person a commensurate salary. That knowledge is able to help the person run his or her family. So that way it is power. But on the other hand, knowledge alone doesn't make a person. It is a set of habits which is headed, which is led by the most important attribute called as humility. Humble. You may end up meeting so many people in your life. Just think of them. If you think very carefully, those people who live an indelible mark in your minds are those who have managed to remain very humble. They will have immense knowledge. You wouldn't even know that this person has knowledge. You will end up knowing that person has knowledge only when you break that wheel of humility and you get inside that person. Oh, he's a university in himself. She is an absolute university in herself. So I understand the knowledge of a person. I'm appreciating the knowledge of a person of those who manage to remain humble. So it's not conflicting statements. Knowledge is power and knowledge is humility. Because true knowledge is what? that makes a person both powerful and humble. Well, you have all joined a very revered university. Remember that knowledge is just not in classroom. It comes at every step in life. I've been often citing this in some of my recent lectures. I don't refer to COVID as virus. You know, what do I call COVID? In my words, I call it Corona Charya. I call it Corona plus Acharya because those of you who are even basically introduced to some of our Vedic scriptures will know that there is an instance where a person meets a very revered saint of immense knowledge. He interviews that saint. He asks, Sir, you seem to be the very personification of quintessential knowledge. Can you please tell me who are your gurus? He thought he may end up saying one or two people. That saint said, I've got 24 gurus. This man was startled. The journalist was startled. 24 gurus? Were you suspended or expelled from one school or the other? You've changed 24 gurus? Well, this person said, no, I was never expelled. I was a very... Uh, I was a well-disciplined student. 24 gurus, how? You know what were the names of the gurus? This person says, the mountain is a guru. The snake, the python snake, that's my guru. The crane, the bird that you see, that's my guru. This person wonders, how could a python, the snake be a guru? How could the mountain be a guru? So, this saint replies, I have learned the art of withstanding any amount of challenges and turmoil in your life and you should be unshakable from the mountain. The mountain never moves. You might have heard a lot of tornadoes, a lot of hailstorms, a lot of cyclones hitting our cities. 
have you ever heard Himalayas have moved by 50 kilometers because of the storm? Podigai Malay in the south has moved by 100 kilometers because of the storm? No. Whatever be it, the mountain withstands. I have learned that ability from that. A crane, though it knows that the fishes are just at its hand pick, will wait for the right fish to come. It will keep its leg raised like the one in penance. I learned that from that uh, crane. So every entity in this world has a lesson for us. And to me, I have learned the art of keeping it slightly slow. We were running at a rocket pace till about February 2020. I didn't know where I was, which part of the world I was. I had like 59 lectures packed in 30 days, one in the morning, one in the evening for 30 cities, both India and abroad. I was catching flight after flight. Corona said, stop. Do take a peek look into yourself. Check how your body is. Is it conditioned for such strain? Sit at home, read, give yourself your time. So there is a lesson what Corona has to teach for us. So learning, knowledge acquiring doesn't stop or end only in the classroom. If I come with the thought that four years I've entered Shastra and the teacher is going to give me every bit of knowledge, I'm sure. See, I'm a student of Pilani. I'll tell you, you'll be disappointed. You should know that the classroom one hour is just your start. What you acquire later through reading and your experience and your peer group exposure is what that makes you a complete human being. When I say complete human being from the knowledge sense, attributes wise, qualities wise and miles to go before I sleep said a poet. So what is knowledge? What is Vidya? What is Jnana? Of course, we can classify that into two. One knowledge is that which helps me survive in the current scenario. I'm sure things will get better in the months to come. I'm sure people will head back to their jobs. Those who have lost will hopefully, let's pray that they get back their jobs. So what after that? I acquire knowledge in a certain area. I am a chemical engineer. That's what my certificate says. So I'm a chemical engineer. I know certain aspects of chemical engineering well, certain not well. But even in engineering, I should understand that I have branched into chemical engineering and I know certain aspects well, certain I don't. I may not know much of mechanical engineering. You may end up studying thermodynamics. The other person may end up studying mass transfer operations. So a chemical engineer will know better about heat exchangers rather than a person who's into IT. A person who's studying computer engineering may not end up knowing much about microprocessors which a triple E or an EC student will be knowing. So we should understand that what knowledge we acquire is of a certain area. So there is a big complement to this set. I don't know a lot of it which is beyond my area. So how do I start appreciating those aspects as well? If my aim is to get a job at my uh, my penultimate semester into one of the uh, uh, high paying jobs that you will get but what beyond that so i should learn to appreciate engineering for which i should have had an inclination to it correct i shouldn't have joined because my mother has said my father has said because my cousins have done it i should be liking it so when i have to like a subject i have to start adoring that subject the moment I say I hate physics, I hate maths, I'm sure my experiences with those subjects in the coming months or years is going to be tough. Rather, let's say that what is there in maths to hate it? What's there in physics to hate it? So this concept of disliking a subject should be unlearned from our minds. Only then will engineering as a beautiful art come in us. So that's point number one. Point number two, along with knowledge, what are the other skills that, will, that I will have to acquire over a period of time? Very, very important are the basic human soft skills. Whichever job that you may end up getting, that's different. But learn the basic art of communication. You could have been an introvert all these years. That's no harm. 
you could have been an extrovert all these years that's no harm but have a very very balanced way of speaking acquire that art you may say speaking is only reserved for the political leaders no you may end up in a job where you could be an engineer in one of the big companies like a Schlumberger or an Exxon Mobil where you will be going to plants. You should know what is the right way of communicating. You should know how. So English matters a lot or even one of your regional languages or your mother tongues will matter a lot. You will know how you should know how to keep those sentences intact and beautifully constructed. You should know how to articulate those words. I know when I speak, my tone comes down. I know if I have to say something right, I know how to express it. So your art of communication is something that you need to hone. That is also knowledge. Do not assume that I get the best of my grades in my subjects that will make me the best of the employees. No. So how do I hone my soft skills? Writing, writing, written communication. I draft a mail to my friend. How neatly the sentences should be constructed. There should be no ambiguity in any of my sentences. My friend should be able to get the crux of what I intend to speak through the mail that I have written. Written communication, oral communication, presentation skills, diplomatic skills, negotiation skills, management skills. Sir, I'm not doing my MBA, I'm doing my engineering. If you want to be an engineer without your soft skills, God help this world. So, a lot of skills have to be built. This is also knowledge. So, knowledge is just not the disciplinary courses that you learn, it's also the soft skills. Third, I end up having skills which are very humane in nature. I'm being very considerate to my friends. I'm being very respectful to my teachers. You could still be a cool dude by having all these skills. To be a cool dude, you don't have to disrespect your teacher. You don't have to disrespect your parents because I'm sure your parents would have worked the tough way to send you to institutions of repute. I'm sure you are not the yesterday's Germany Ganeshan called a Sumaitangi where you'll have 10 sisters who are unmarried and four brothers who have to study after you. I'm sure. But whatever little they have, they have shared it for you. So you have a responsibility towards your family. You have a responsibility towards your society. Of course, the ratio of the trees, which is 10 is to 1 in the US, may be just half in India. For every human being, there is only half a tree or even lesser. I'm sure the society could be much better with better roads, with cleaner air. But I am a part of the society. So why should I keep blaming the society if I'm not contributing towards it? So responsibility as a human being, as a son or a daughter, as a brother or a sister, as a citizen of the society and the nation becomes very, very important. So your knowledge from the discipline where you've chosen, the skills that you're going to hone over a period of time, the duties and the responsibilities that I have as a member of my family, as a part of the community, as a part of this larger nation is very important. And all this when coupled together will give us that supreme power or knowledge which will help me as a human being. So and as these come in the right proportions, I'm sure humility will come by itself. Because what is humility? You tell the other world, even without telling, I have known little. I am acquiring very little. What I don't know is this entire world. In Tamil, there is a saying. Those of you who may have not learned Tamil, learn the saying. Katra the kaiyalag. What I know is just the size of my closed fist. Katra the kaiyalag. Kallada the ulagalag. What I haven't learned. Is the size of this world. What I've learned is only this much. What I haven't learned is the world size. When we have this thought truly, you become humble. Because humility is a sign of acquiring knowledge. Arrogance is a sign of stopping knowledge. So that is why Jnanam Paramam Balam, which is knowledge is supreme power, and Vidya Dadati Vinayam, knowledge gives humility, go hand in hand. When you're humble, you acquire more knowledge. As you acquire knowledge, you get powerful. But as you get powerful, you get humble. And as you get powerful, you acquire knowledge. So it's like a cycle. 
the more powerful you get by acquiring knowledge the more humble you become and the more humble you become you get or uh, more avenues to acquire knowledge so it's like a cycle they are not mutually exclusive they are not distinct they are one and the same well we have spoken about all of this on the other side if i i have had the opportunity to attend a few conclaves organized by a lot of media groups something which people say think differently i wonder should i be walking on my hands to think differently no you could be the same human being but now is the time of startups an idea comes just like this an idea but how do i translate that idea and is that idea relevant is that what the current society needs how do i come up with that idea once i get the idea how do i translate that into action and into action how do i make that beneficial to me my family my society and the nation so this is the journey of most most startups you might have noticed a lot of startups that work on the hotel space imagine 15 20 years before even 15 years before while our parents wanted to take us to one of the hill stations they wouldn't have had much knowledge on how the hotel is so you know what was the easiest way we will take up a, a, a government bus we will land up in that place we will go street after street hunting after the hotel and then we wouldn't even check the rooms so today we there was one person who thought let me collate information on hotels their pricing their facilities the rooms the cleanliness the hygiene what other facilities they have in the hotel let me come on one dashboard and give a lot of information on the hotels their features of one particular city likewise multiply that with cities so if i have to go to a city i try the city's name i get about 1150 hotels they are rated by customers feed customer feedback is given i understand what are the pros and cons and then i decide so this is an idea not that this idea was absent in those days a person came he implemented that idea imagine 150 years before i'm not sure even if there were hotels or not people used to had to cook by themselves but then came the concept of hotels but i wouldn't know which hotel is the best which is the closest to my mind then came an idea that i have 50 hotels around me which are in a distance of between 1 and 5 kilometers these hotels have offer these menus this is the rating this is the pricing i get into an idea and somebody implemented that idea imagine 15 20 years before we had to fight with the auto rickshaw person saying that for this distance of 2 kilometers you're charging me 100 i am a middle class person where will i give you then came a person with an idea who said let me make a pool of people who drive taxis and autos for this distance let's fix the price let him take this percentage so you are not going to lose much he is not going to lose much so both of you let it be a win win situation so they came up with an idea so this is the era of ideas and ideas being implemented and it doesn't say that only after you graduate you should come up with ideas even while you are in a learning phase you can come up with ideas so that is also knowledge and that knowledge is just not going to make you powerful but it is going to make the society powerful look at the kind of community programs people come up with there is one foundation that gives oh, free meals to over 20 lakh school studying children a day 20 lakh i don't even know if this is the population of a country like new zealand so that population is being fed every day imagine multiplied into 30 days multiplied into 365 days look at the numbers that you see that's an idea because if you look at a lot of the low income groups and people in the villages there are certain families which may not encourage their children going to school so one of the easiest ways to convince the parents besides giving them the gyan that knowledge is powerful supreme and all of that is don't do not worry one meal will provide for your child at least for that reason they will send their children to school so this is one of the easiest ways you can feed an education at a very at the grassroots level there is some person who has thought about that there is a foundation that works on that look at the ideas that come around us i am in fact surprised and very impressed with what kind of thinking goes into the youngsters i'm sure you're all 
very young, with such bright minds in the society and with such bright minds entering a, a reputed name like Shastra, I'm sure the university is going to see a lot more new ideas coming up which will benefit the society. But remember, behind all of this is the grassroots knowledge which our civilization is given, which is knowledge bestows humility. As long as we are humble, that knowledge will always stay with us. So I think I've taken a lot of your time. We will now open the session for questions. Namaste. Thank you very much, sir, for the wonderful speech. Uh, here comes the questions. There are some questions that the students have posted. Uh, mm -hmm. When a student asks a question, should a teacher give answer or should propel, direct and empower the student to find their own answers? Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Shankar Sriram, and uh, thanks a lot, uh, Shastra University. And uh, uh, my dear friends, uh, you'll be uh, uh, you'll be really happy to know that there are over 2,500 students who are listening right now. So I'm very thankful to each one of you for taking the time to uh, uh, to be a part of this orientation outreach of uh, Shastra University. Uh, I hope I'm visible, uh, Shankar. Yeah, perfect. Okay, and I'm audible as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your question was, when a student, a pupil, a Sishya asks a question, should the teacher answer immediately or should the teacher, be it a he or a she, should give a lot of steps? Should they propel to get uh, answers from the students? Um, uh, at this point in time, uh, I, I would just like to go uh, one step into our uh, uh, Vedic civilization, the civilization of this larger Indian subcontinent, which is being the teacher is given the responsibility and the duty to uh, dispense knowledge. So we should leave it to the wisdom of the teacher. At times in our own uh, system in the past, when we look to the scriptures, when questions were asked by students, the teacher would answer immediately. So the teacher will know what questions to answer immediately and what questions need to be given time because there are certain questions for which uh, uh, experience gives you answers so probably we should leave it, leave it to the uh, uh, teacher's wisdom nevertheless um, my uh, uh, if if you were to ask me uh, saying that if you were a teacher what you would do i would rather collaborate with the student to get an answer rather than giving the answer directly uh, because the moment i give the answer uh, directly it it wouldn't make the student think as much as what he would do in a collaboration. A simple example that I can give of this is, uh, Shankar, um, uh, I, I'm sure a lot of my uh, friends who are listening to the session will also be uh, fans too. So while I used to be uh, 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 reading Harry Potter while I was a student, um, the kind of imagination that I had with uh, the authoress's uh, description in Harry Potter in all the seven volumes, I will tell you was much, much better than the movies that were shot. So uh, at times I believe our imagination canvas is so large and so beautiful that we can actually beat some of the best filmmakers in the world. So the moment we give answers and a visual canvas in front of the student, I believe the student, we are not enabling the student to think. So to a large extent, if I were a teacher, I will rather collaborate with the student to get an answer rather than giving the answer directly. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it would rather uh, inculcate the, the practice of self-learning from the student. And after that, we can correct uh, if they are wrong or uh, so. So sure. uh, another question from one of the student is that what is the difference between knowledge and wisdom? And if you are going to say that knowledge is power and what is wisdom then? Okay, so um, in our uh, 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 civilization, we have had a variety of languages, right? Let me begin from the language where the students are enrolled in. They are going to study in the very, very ancient and very celebrated capital of the Cholas. Cholas were uh, one of the largest kingdoms, um, uh, 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 a long-lasting kingdom. So it lasted for over 1,000 years. When I say 1,000, it is thousands and thousands of years, as simple as that, because we also have references even in the 2nd and the 3rd century. 
So they lasted for a very long time. And remember, it's just a trivia that I'm saying. They were a dynasty with which were the uh, uh, pioneers of naval fleet. So Cholas brought this concept of having the naval power because of which we were able to expand our uh, presence to Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, and then to Sri Vijaya in the archipelago nation of Indonesia. So speaking from the land of Tanjavur, Tamil is such a beautiful, such a sweet, such an ancient language. So Tamil has been used in our civilization. We have the neighboring states of Malayalam, Kannada, and Telugu. Let's go north. Marathi is so beautiful. Bengali, what can get more sweeter than Bengali? And Gujarati, of course, uh, like they add so much of good and sweet in their dishes. Their language is also sweet. And as we go upwards, Hindi, what a profound language it is. So we are a land of a plethora of languages where each language is so beautiful. In English, there is often a statement that said, they are the best among equals. So each language is the best among equals. So there's nothing like this is better or that is better. All languages are so beautiful. Nevertheless, when we look at our ancient scriptures, uh, to a large extent, Sanskritam as a language was used. In Sanskrit, for a same uh, meaning, a word that we uh, may associate in English, there will be 10 or more different words. For example, let's take gold. In the Mendeleev's uh, table, we call it aurum, A-U. So A-U is gold, as simple as that. Or probably we may go one step ahead. In, in the West, they say, they call it the yellow metal. Otherwise, it's gold. But I'll tell you in Sanskritam, it's called Hema. You must have heard of girls being called as Hema because Lakshmi is gold hued. So she's called Hema. Kanaka, very close uh, to the capital city of uh, Tamil Nadu, which is Chennai, is a beautiful hamlet called Tiruvallur where the goddess Lakshmi is called Kanakavalli, the creeper which resembles gold. So Kanaka, Hema, Swarna, Suvarna, Hataka, there are 10 or more different words. In fact, I remember one student uh, uh, from the University of Bombay who was researching on the different names of gold in Sanskrit. So that was his PhD topic. So when you look at Sanskritam, the language tries to ascribe as many names as possible for a word. But for every synonymous word that it wants to relate to, it will have a delineation or etymological meaning. Likewise, when we look for knowledge, knowledge could be tre treated as just raw knowledge. Or when that knowledge matures and gets implemented and internalized, it becomes wisdom. Now, let me take uh, a, a very, very... Uh, uh, a, a raw example of what we face day in and day out. I'm sure a lot of uh, my friends who are watching this will agree. We have learned from a very young age, even during the school days and then uh, during the college days, if, if a lot of them happen to study their 11th and 12th in colleges in other states, they will know. We have known that lungs form a very, very integral part to our respiratory system. We also know that Smoking, though it may seem cool, is not so good for the lungs. So a person knows lungs is an integral part of the respiratory system. A person knows smoking is not good for one's health, despite that a person smokes. Now, what he or she knows about smoking, that smoking is bad for health, lungs is an integral part of the respiratory system, all of this is knowledge. When that is not implemented, when that is not internalized, then that knowledge has failed to mature into wisdom. Let's take another classic example from the times of Mahabharata. Now we're just going to go north. In Mahabharata, we have the sons of Pandu who were called Pandavas. The sons of Dhritarashtra were called Dartarashtras. People generally call them Kauravas. Technically, people who come in the line of Kuru were Kauravas. But both Pandavas and Dartarashtras were to be called Kauravas. But somehow at times, um, uh, common nouns become proper nouns and so they were called Kauravas. So they were technically Pandavas and Dhartarashtras, the sons of Dhritarashtra. So all of them, they did not study in different schools and colleges. They all studied in one tutelage that was called uh, Dronacharya's University. So in incidentally, he had his village that was dedicated to dispensing knowledge. That village, that gram, which was done by Dronacharya, the guru, was called Guru Gram. Today, a lot of them call it Gurgaon 
and again it's back to Guru, Guru Gram again. So all of these uh, uh, aristocratic children of Pandu and Dhritarashtra studied under one teacher. But here we have one lady called Draupadi who was married to their brothers for Duryodhana, be it uh, Yudhishthira, Bhima, Arjuna, Nakula and Sahadeva, they were all brothers. So Draupadi was a sister-in-law and she was menstruating, she was in her periods. And on that day, while she was menstruating, she tells Ekavastra Rajaswala, I am in my single piece of cloth, do not disturb me, Dushasana. So Dushasana pulled her to the middle of the court while the entire floor was strewn with blood, of her menstrual blood. And she was to be disrobed in the middle of the court, in the middle of the court, right in front of the eyes of Dhritarashtra. Dhritarashtra cannot just escape saying I'm blind. He was blind externally. He was not blind in Internally. So, none of them, Bhishmacharya, the one who gave us Vishnu Sahasranamam, did not even say this is wrong. He said, I'm caught between Article 53A and 63F whether to give you justice or not. There was another person called Dronacharya. Dronacharya did not share a good relationship with Draupadi's father, Drupada. Yet, he could have supported the woman who was in distress. He didn't do it. Kripacharya, another learned scholar, he didn't do it. So, in fact, Karna, whom we all adore, if, if we hear the name Karna, we uh, people who have watched Tamil movies will have the picture of Shivaji Ganeshan. Karna was not that holy. If he was so uh, judicious and he was so prudent, he would have fought the case of Draupadi. He in turn said, a lady who is married five men cannot be a chaste wife. So he wanted to disrobe her. So he asked Shakuni to uh, uh, ask Dushasana to disrobe her. So all this, when we look at this, they have graduated from the University of Dronacharya. They have learned for years together this knowledge. But where is the wisdom? So they may have badges saying that, yes, I've graduated out of uh, Dronacharya's university. In my humble opinion, that didn't mature into wisdom. In fact, there were only two people from the other side who stood for the justice of Draupadi. One was the one who was born along with Duryodhana, surprisingly one of the only brothers in the hundred called Vikarna who said, see Duryodhana, you may have um, a feud with your brothers, that's okay. But do not drag somebody else's wife and humiliate her in this state in the presence of so many elders. One. Second was Vidura. Vidura was the youngest brother besides uh, Dhritarashtra and Pandu. He was the other brother. He stood up and said, please do not do this. Do not cause the downfall of this celebrated kingdom. So there were two people. So in my opinion, in that court, only two of them had wisdom. Everybody else had knowledge. Great. Superb, sir. Uh, another question. Uh, in recent times, we are more titled towards getting correct answer. Mm. Is that not that incorrect answers leads to learning? What is uh, the take on this in our ancient civilization? Um, uh, thank you, Sri Ram. Now, for example, if our civilization had ever thought that answer must only be correct, please be very careful uh, while listening. I'm saying if our civilization had thought that answer must only be correct and if there was only one correct answer, I'm sure our civilization wouldn't have lasted. I'll tell you why. Let's take one classic example of certain aphorisms. Aphorisms are cryptic statements. Let's take Athao Brahma Jignasa, Antara Chapitu Tadrishtehe, Shastra Yonitva. These are all sutrams. Sutra in Sanskrit means that which is a garland. So that which where words have been strung together, if they talk about the art of getting salvation, moksham, it is Vedanta Sutra or Brahma Sutra. It talks, if it talks about the art of making love between couples, it is Kama Sutra. So Sutra in itself is a garland. So here we have Brahma Sutras that talk about emancipation. They talk about salvation. They talk about moksha. Now, if Veda Vyasa's Brahma Sutras were the only correct answer, and if beyond this nobody else was allowed to interpret, then we wouldn't have the, uh, the philosophy of Advaita by Adi Shankaracharya. We wouldn't have the philosophy of Visishta Advaita by Ramanujacharya. We wouldn't have the philosophy of Dvaita by Madhvacharya. Be it the philosophy of non-dualism, qualified non-dualism or dualism are beautiful 
authenticated, very prudently done, very wisely done, very beautifully presented set of philosophies and their substantiating explanations given by these Acharyas. So we wouldn't have had any of these philosophies if the answer was, okay, there is only one correct answer, you have to accept that. Either you accept that or no. No, our civilization has never worked that way. If that it, uh, if it had worked that way, then Arjuna shouldn't have had questions. If everything was picture perfect and there were correct answers, why should he ask questions? Because there were questions which, which he didn't uh, understand. There were questions which he felt were left, left unanswered was the dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna. So our civilization, I can, I don't have the qualification to comment about other civilizations of the world because I have not had that experience or that opportunity to learn much. Whatever little I know about Indian civilization or the Indic civilization is what I can talk and present. In my humble opinion, the concept of getting correct answer, I have to get correct answer. You have to give correct answer. There is only one correct answer is absolutely flawed then uh, i think the world is going to go towards destruction we will have to assume that every question will have an answer but that answer need not have to first of all impress me see if we think that the answer has to impress me and i will listen to only an answer that impresses me then again i'm not being a learner so i should have the ability to accept that answer and if I find the answer not so convincing, it is my responsibility to research more and come up with a better answer. I cannot keep questioning the person who has given me the answer. It's my duty as well. So the concept of getting the correct answer and the concept of not allowing another form of answer or opinion is wrong, in my opinion, which is against the uh, Vedic civilization one. And uh, our civilization also believes that answers need not have to come at that moment it can come over a period of time for example life itself is such a learning experience for us imagine seven months before i'm sure none of the students could have ever thought that there will be a lockdown throughout the country most big economies of the world will be fumbling and will be struggling for uh, just imagine Flights were such a norm. I used to take about 100 flights a year. In the last seven months, I don't even know how an airport looks. So the seven months of my life has been such a learning experience for me. I have been learning so much every day, day in and day out. I don't think seven or eight months before people could ever think, people who were having maid servants at home could ever think that they could do without maid servants. For three months time when there was lockdown initially, which was very strict, people had to do it by themselves. So learning life itself is an experience so we should let life unfold and give us the answers rather than we forcing somebody at a knife edge and telling that you have to give the correct answer thank you thank you for the wonderful answer uh, there is uh, one more question how can a person be confident and humble at the same time when they know they do know a lot uh, they cannot be very, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, when they know, they do not know a lot, they cannot be very confident, right? So uh, how are you going to, uh, how, how a person can be confident and humble at the same time? If somebody is uh, aware that he is not good at something, for sure he will not be confident. Uh, uh, thanks, Sridham. Let me take the example of uh, mathematics. At the uh, 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 grade of one, while I'm in the first grade, I learn numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is what my teacher has taught me. While a guest comes home, my father tells me, why don't you tell the numbers? Now I end up saying, see father, mathematics has so many other things. It has got integral calculus. It has got UV principle. It has got I8, inverse logarithmic, algebraic, trigonometric, and exponential. What to be used as U and what to be used as V. It also has other forms of equations and I have to get into uh, uh, geometrical rules as well. I need to talk about the rules of analytical geometry. Only after I know all of that will I be confident. And only when I'm confident, I'm going to tell. My father asked me a simple question. Can you tell what the numbers 1 to 10? This is what my teacher has taught. I should be confident about what I have learned. If I say that confidence will only come when I become a master in that language, tell me one person, some intelligent person in this world 
who has in written black and white said that i am an expert in this a person who is an expert will never say that the person will keep telling in fact there is a upanishadic saying which says avijnato vijanatam the one who says i don't know much is actually the person who knows a lot and the person who says that i know a lot actually doesn't know much so confidence should not become overconfidence at the same time confidence should not become diffidence if i know numbers 1 to 10 i just tell those numbers as simple as that i say that confidently i say that with a complete belief that what i have learned is right i tell it with a complete belief that my teacher has taught me right so confidence is not arrogance see people generally confuse the both they think being confident is being arrogant confidence is presenting what i know arrogance is telling the person that the person opposite me doesn't know what i know great i don't have to judge the other person so i don't have to be arrogant so there's a thin line i have to be confident that what i have learned is fine i'm going to present that so that's confidence but the question is how will confidence and humility come at the same time see if krishna was not humble just imagine his past time let's uh, some some of them may think krishna's life history was a real happening some of them may think it's a story whichever way you think let's get into krishna's past times right from a young age he did all extraordinary things he lifted a mountain he danced on a snake he killed so many demons and demonesses so all this was a part of his curriculum vitae but imagine later when he became the king of dwaraka he held the largest fleet today while we are uh, 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 having a problem with china A, a, a lot of the experts right okay so india is very confident is it, it is an emerging economy it is uh, strong but at the same time some of them say oh china has a bigger army so what likewise krishna had a very very big army in fact if his army was not strong capable and big enough duryodhana wouldn't have asked for his army's help so it was called narayani and the entire army was serving on the side of kauravas and the leader of that army called krishna was uh, uh, the charioteer on the other side imagine these five brothers were fighting for their kingdom they didn't get even a single piece of land on the other hand krishna was ruling an island nation called dwaraka he had the largest army he was super powerful he was extremely famous he was extremely articulate very very good strategist but look at his humility to help his friend get justice to help his cousins get justice he became a charioteer for them so he had to sit at a step imagine the entire field of kurukshetra you wouldn't know the names of the drivers of anybody but here was one king of dwaraka who was seated as a driver if he was confident at the same time humble if it was not humility how could he become a charioteer see you are at such a great position people at least 100 people know me tomorrow if somebody tells uh my maid servant is off could you please come and sweep both you and me will take it as a prestige problem we will say how can i come and sweep but here is krishna who tells for the sake of justice and dharma i am ready to be somebody sarathi so confidence is not arrogance confidence is the ability to present very very well what i have learned humility is a great attribute which comes by acquiring the la- la- right form of knowledge so in my humble opinion humility vinayam and knowledge which matures into wisdom can both go hand in hand they are not diametrically opposite and to say that a person is confident and humble is not an oxymoron thank you sir thank you very much for the uh, answer beautiful answer uh, what is iq uh, what role it makes in gaining knowledge uh see the word iq eq uh, as much as people talk about iq in the management uh, field we also speak about eq emotional quotient as well so uh, these are all terms that uh, great management gurus have come up with my utter uh, 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 namaskarams and obeisances to such management gurus but uh, uh, this is one in the modern uh, sense of understanding management these are ratings or ways of understanding a person's intelligence so i don't think in the larger indian context this iq and eq uh, will uh, be uh, 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 required because we generally come from backgrounds which come with lot of intelligence and emotion 
For example, uh, I don't know, uh, I, I'm sure uh, at least out of the 2,300 children uh, who are listening to this session, my dear friends, none of them will ever ask their parents' permission to talk to them. Mom, I wish to talk to you. Can I talk to you? We never ask. We just go and speak. So we are brought up in a culture where we take uh, relationships so close to our heart that we don't uh, go deep into formalities. So be it intelligence or be it emotion, we have always been uh, very, very strong at it. So uh, in my opinion, these are all management words. When management professors teach you, please accept it with a lot of humility and learn it. But in the larger context, this IQ and EQ are just ways of um, uh, articulating simple terms. See, I generally tell people, while I used to be in Pilani, there used to be a statement, scintillate, scintillate, you minuscule asteroid in the vast expanse of the splendid sky. And people will be wondering, where did this uh, Tarur English come? And then the answer is, twinkle, twinkle, little star. So the statement, twinkle, twinkle, little star is told in such a beautiful way, scintillate, scintillate, you minuscule asteroid. So I think the modern way of looking at management is making simple things look very big. In our Indian context, those simple things can remain simple things. Great. Uh, see, is there a threshold for being humble? Because you can't be humble throughout. Uh, at times, because especially with this competitive scenario, at times mm -hmm. you will have to expose your technical arrogance. So <laughs> there is one question relating to that. Is there a threshold or what is the point till which you have to be humble? See, first of all, uh, to generalize uh, any value or virtue isn't right. Yes, agreed that knowledge and wisdom comes with a lot of humility. We need to trust in both of these attributes and have to give due importance in accordance to both. Nevertheless, to understand what is the threshold, each individual should be able to determine his or her strengths and weaknesses. So uh, just to assert one's technical prudence and competitive spirit, it doesn't mean you'll have to be not humble. So you could still be very assertive and yet be very humble. See, that's what life is all about. You have to bring a lot of the opposing attributes at one place. Uh, in Sanskrit, it's called Aghatita Ghatana Samarthyam. So uh, uh, the classic example is when the Lord came as a man lion, which is Nisimhamurti, to protect his ardent devotee Prahlada. They say that at one hand, he was actually tearing open the uh, abdomen of the demon called Hiranyakashipu. And on the other side, his eyes were filled with vatsalya, motherhood, and he was looking at Prahlada. See, generally in this world, we can't express these two emotions at the same time. Generally, if I'm angry, I'll say, see, I'm very angry. Don't come to me now. Let me cool down and then I'll talk to you later. So I believe that being cool and talking cannot come when I'm angry. Or on the other hand, I will say, see, I'm in a very good mood now. Don't make me angry. So I'm telling the person, see, I'm very happy. Don't make me angry. But here is Nisimha. At one point in time, he was showing anger. At the same instant, he was showing love to Prahlada. Saroja sadrsha drsha vyati bhishadjate vyajjate tells Vedanta Deshika. So we have assumed in our minds that humility and wisdom let's take knowledge in terms of the technical parlance, cannot go hand in hand. That's where I'm saying it's wrong. We will have to determine our strengths and weaknesses and we need to understand if we can make these two opposite things meet. They are not mutually exclusive, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another question is, uh, how to remain positive and motivated in difficult situations? Any correlations uh, or examples that you would like to quote? Uh, That's a question. Um, yeah. See, uh, uh, when we speak of difficult situations, had this orientation lecture been like seven or eight months before, I would have had to think of situations. Now I don't have to think. COVID situation is one of the toughest that the world has ever faced. And the, lar uh, the, the last pandemic that we had was in 1920 when we didn't have internet, we didn't have computers. That was a different world. Today, when we thought that we were actually progressing, that is when some small thing, a pathogen, was able to tell. See, generally, I tell people who interview me. It's called Corona Acharya. Because Corona is also an Acharya. It is giving you a teaching. Slow down. Understand to do things which you are accustomed to and which is your comfort level. That's what we all did. 
So uh, in difficult situations, how to remain positive is with a simple thought. In Tamil we say, Iduvum kadandu pogum. This will also cross. This situation will also ease in and we will have better times. So looking at a very pleasant and a rosy future is the best way to come across the present tough time. So uh, 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 realizing that the current time is tough is important. At the same time to assume that this is the end of it is absolute diffidence. So something will change. We, uh, we were thinking that the lockdown is going to continue for another six months. Now things are looking like normal. So things will change. So remaining positive is one. In my humble opinion, uh, since the students have asked this, uh, I have also been a hostelier for over uh, uh, four years. And, uh, uh, and Pilani and uh, at least Tanjavur has a very close airport. For us, the closest airport was 250 kilometers away. So either we had to walk or we had to drive it down. And at, at that point in time, the roads were also not so good. So uh, in my humble opinion, um, I would say if, if somebody wants to take my suggestion or request to remain positive, Read books which will give you wisdom. Of course, there is one set, the uh, Chetan Bhagat books. There are uh, a trilogy series and all of it. Read some nice books. The Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Read Siddhartha by Herman Hesse. So many, so many books that make you think. When you think, you start getting very positive. So reading is one essential attribute and listening as well. Our civilization has believed in Shravanam, listening. Listen to as many motivational talks as possible. At times, they actually elevate your spirits. So these are some of the ways. Uh, another question from the sure. from the student is: <coughs> In our current education system, marks are glorified right from childhood. Mm. We are brainwashed to think that marks are a validation of our knowledge, although marks are just numbers and doesn't say anything about our capacity. What is your uh, stand on this? I mean. One of the student is asking this question. Uh, this uh, concept may not be uh, only uh, uh, true to the Indian subcontinent, but it is uh, widespread in most other countries as well. And uh, if you ask me whether to judge a student, especially a child, even in the kindergarten or even in the primary level based on marks, may seem wrong. May seem wrong. So rather than saying may seem wrong, it is wrong. Uh, but at the same time, we also need to understand that uh, to actually uh, talk about mundane processes like admission, uh, entry, there needs to be some kind of a decision made at a level. And examination becomes one of the easiest ways. But again, the point is examination alone will not determine the future of the student. Examination alone will not determine what kind of a future the student is going to see. That much I believe in. But let's not discard the part of examination as well. Even after getting tutored under Dronacharya, there was a day when all the Pandavas and Kauravas had to exhibit their prowess. And uh, in that exhibiting part of prowess, to a large extent, Arjuna emerged victorious. Just because Arjuna emerged victorious, it didn't mean that the other Pandavas were uh, good for nothing. They were also good, but he was better amongst them. So examination may be one of the easiest ways for uh, schools, universities and colleges to actually uh, uh, do their regular processes like admission, promotion and so on. But at the same time, the belief is right that uh, examination alone will not determine that person. So the society should actually get off this concept that, okay, if there is a person uh, who has scored marks and the person, there's another one who hasn't scored marks, comparing them, ridiculing them, making the other one seem very glorified is going to take us nowhere because we can't have only first rank holders in the entire country yeah uh, beautiful sir uh, i mean uh, another qu the next question is directly on you yeah. <laughs> stage fear st stops opportunities can you give some tips to overcome it and be confident like you see um i feel there are a, there, there are countless innumerable considering a pop Indian population of say 1.4 1.5 billion 1.4 billion is what we believe and uh, Sriman Trump says it's 1.5 billion in his <laughs> last press meet so let's uh, uh, give the benefit of doubt and uh, let's talk like the auto uh, person who says let's have it as 1.45 whatever way 
when we look at a population of 1.4, 1.45, 1.5 billion in our country, I'm sure at least half of them will be uh, uh, born speakers. I'm very confident with my little experience, I can tell you half of them, half of them is close to 70.75 billion, which is again, more than twice the population of US. So that population in India are born speakers. But being a born speaker, alone is not enough how to uh, uh, inculcate those skills hone your skills to become a good public speaker is when i say public speaker you don't have to address an election rally of one lakh even to address make a presentation in your classroom or to talk to your peers talk to your professors talk to uh, companies that may come in your fourth year for placements uh, the first thing is feel that people who are listening to you are actually your friends See, we often, when we get onto our stage, we often think that if I speak like this, somebody will make fun of me. Somebody will ridicule me. That person didn't like me. The moment you start thinking your audience as not your enemy, not going to motivate you, then you will start getting the fear. I have complete confidence that Shankar Sriram is my friend. I have complete confidence that the 2,500 students who are listening, who are part of this orientation program are my friends. I'm sure they're all liking this session. That's the confidence that I have. It is with this confidence that I'm speaking. The moment I think, hey, somebody will make fun of me. Yeah. You know what? The moment I start thinking that way, I'm sure I'm going to fall off track. So first thing is first, trust your audience. Trust and they are a part of you. They are your friends. Second thing is, some people have this attribute of telling that you should think and talk, which is very correct. If we don't do that, then our speech will be uh, without any content. But at the same time, to be a speaker, do not think and think and think and think and talk. Such pauses, irrelevant pauses will put off your audience. So always think and talk, but the process, the time gap between thinking and talking should be so nano that the listener should not be able to differentiate where he was thinking and where he was talking. It should be so close. The great Tamil poet, while Rama lifted the bow, people did not know what was the time gap between Rama lifting the bow and breaking the bow because both were so consecutive. That is one. And the third thing is, uh, try to develop some amount of wholesome knowledge. Uh, even if I'm an engineer, I should know little about medicine as well. I don't have to do become a doctor. I have to know that, oh, okay, so he becomes a physician first, then a, consulting, uh, a consultant. So he has branched into endocrinology. So what does that deal with endocrine glands? So, they, so try to develop little knowledge of all sectors. That is very, very important. To just say, I'm, uh, I'm an engineer, I'm going to learn engineering. Why should I learn about medicine? No. So the moment we stop putting barricades, we start putting barricades to knowledge, then I don't develop wholesome knowledge. So to be a decent speaker, first, trust your audience. Second, you mean removing the negativity. Confident. You mean the removing yeah, the negativity. negativity. Yeah. yeah. Negativity, even without Corona, people will have. But <laughs> we should take the effort <clears throat> to become positive. That's very, very important. Yeah. Uh, another question uh, is, uh, how did you manage between studies at Bitspilani and doing Harikatha while studying there? Time management. Uh, actually, I will. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I used to give about uh, a single lecture. See, at that point in time, I was uh, very naive. Even now I am. So uh, my uh, thought of giving a lecture was, uh, uh, was instigated or probably uh, somebody... Uh, made that dormant active was my vice chancellor then my dean then who just said why don't you try something like the traditional storytelling the upanyasa i was a bit uh, I, I was not that confident of course they boosted a lot of confidence in me and i started speaking so it used to be like one per semester so we had a semester of say four and a half months and four and a half months roughly translates to about uh, 130 135 days and one day out of 135 days and one hour out of that one day so I don't think it was a big time management and all of that. And that was one of the easiest ways, like you can call it a stress buster for me. And as well as for some of my friends who used to attend my lecture. So it was no rocket science. Um, and uh, look, at, uh, talking about the art of um, uh, developing, uh, being a Harikatha artist during my Pilani days, 
I never had the thought of becoming a Harikatha artist at that point in time. Of course, I used to listen to a lot of lectures. At least uh, I would have listened to about 4,000, 5,000 hours of lectures. Uh, I, I, I'm just giving you a rough number. Like, uh, never a day went without listening to lectures. So more than speaking, I used to listen to a lot of lectures. And the lectures could be from various religions, various beliefs, various topics, right? From science to religion, I used to listen to a lot of things. So in my belief, I believe that... Uh, any form of talk is knowledge. So we should listen to as much as possible. So that was the easiest way for me during my Pilani days. Great, sir. Last two questions before we wind up the session. Uh, sure. Uh, how to remain balanced uh, in, in, the con in, in my classroom with I have to be competitive with my friends and also maintain the friendship with, my, with them. So how do I balance that? That's the, that's the next question. So if you're competing with your friend, then balancing your friendship and relationship is going to be tough. But if you're going to uh, co compete with your friend's caliber, then maintaining the friendship is easy. So uh, we should separate the two. I am not competing with Sriram. I'm not competing with Dr. Shankar Sriram. If Dr. Shankar Sriram is an expert in mathematics and I am also a classmate of his in mathematics, I'm competing with his skill in mathematics, not with him. See, the moment we make it personal war, I'm sure uh, it's going to make both our lives tough. So it's it's very simple. I'm going to compete with your skill, not with you. And uh, For example, they often tell, uh, in Sanskrit, there are two words. The name. So for example, Shankar Sriram is the name. And uh, you are owning the name. So your body in this janma is called Shankar Sriram. So you're called Nami, while the name is called Nama. So what protected Draupadi, people generally say Lord Krishna came and protected. If you look at very, very intently in Mahabharata, Krishna was actually uh, defending the borders of Dwaraka because it was laid to siege. So he was not present in Hastinapura. Dwaraka is somewhere near Jamnagar in Gujarat. And Hastinapura is somewhere uh, Uttar Pradesh and between Delhi. So there was Draupadi being humiliated and Krishna was fighting the war in Dwaraka, which is in Jamnagar, Gujarat. Even if he had taken the last flight from Jamnagar, it would have taken at least two hours by which Draupadi would have been completely disrobed. So the, Krishna was not there. Remember, it was Krishna's name which was used. It was not Nami. It was Namam. Likewise, we should separate take the person from his skin, then I will end up in problems. If I'm competing with the person's caliber, I will only improve. So I don't think this is going to lead to any arrogance or any ego war competing with the skill and not with the person. Well said, sir. Last question before we wind up the session today. Uh, knowledge is power. Uh, yeah. We all know that yeah. power can be misused. So how can a knowledge knowledgeable person who after acclaiming power can misuse it. Your, your thoughts on this? See, uh, that's where at the commencement, we spoke about the difference between knowledge and wisdom. This is in the Vedantic parlance. Even in our general system, we differentiate between what is literacy and education, right? So we say uh, one state has 99% literacy, this state has 98% literacy. What is literacy? The ability to read, speak and write a particular language. That is literacy. That's all. But what is education? Literacy when combined with loads and loads and loads of values and virtues and implementation of those values makes that person educated. So that's why we say the person is literate but not educated. We say that the person has acquired knowledge, but not wisdom. Likewise, if you if your question is, knowledge can actually lead to misuse of power because knowledge is power. When there is knowledge, it could lead to misuse of power. That's where I differ. If that knowledge has been acquired in the right way and has been internalized in the right way, it will never lead to misuse of power. Only when it is acquired in the wrong way, it will lead to misuse of power. A simple example, People generally say what Dronacharya did with Ekalavya was wrong. They say that uh, uh, this little boy wanted to learn from Dronacharya. Uh, since he couldn't join, uh, he used to uh, secretly listen to the classes and uh, uh, he did that. So what Dronacharya did was wrong. 
in my opinion let's see it this way why can't we also see it this way what knowledge dronacharya was imparting was the formalized form of knowledge so how do i formalize knowledge when i join a university so i have taken admission to shastra i have paid the fees i have been attending the online classes this is the formal way instead i use the wrong set of credentials uh, uh, hack the site of shastra and then i somehow find ways to, to access the online class for paying fees then am i not stealing the property rights the hard work of the person likewise ekalavya even without going under formal training under dronacharya he didn't even seek permission from dronacharya without that he was using the copyright which was wrong so there copyright is another way of yeah. looking at things as well so uh, in my uh, in my uh, humble opinion i feel that the right form of knowledge when acquired right way and internalized the right way can never ever lead to misuse of power if this power the person has not acquired knowledge thank you very much sir thank you very much for the patient answers and the wonderful lecture on uh, uh, knowledge is power uh, we had more than 2700 students uh, who were uh, listening to your talk and i really appreciate your uh, uh, your patience in answering all the questions uh, without any ambiguity it was crystal clear and uh, we thank you very much for your uh, wonderful lecture and the uh, uh, motivational talk series thank you and uh, uh, shriram yes, ji shriram ji uh, using this medium uh, along uh, with your vote of thanks i have to give a vote of thanks to shastra because uh, shastra is another home for me i've been visiting shastra campus for so many times and uh, my my humble uh, pranamams to all the students who have been listening who have made time Uh, i know this year wouldn't have been easy for any of these students but you have all been such a sport and you have uh, you have begun the right way and i'm sure by the grace of uh, the almighty in whoever you believe by i'm sure by the grace of all acharyas all your lives will be surely very very colorful and very very successful and uh, you're all going to come to a very very celebrated town of uh, tanjavur and a very very respected uh, campus called shastra shastra itself the word means shastram and uh, i'm sure all of you will be very very successful thanks shri ram ji for giving me an opportunity you can wind up the session thank you thank you very much sir thank you